So, very quickly, New Zealand has some of the, the most pristine systems around the world. Uh, I won't tell you where this is. Uh, there's a lot of bush fashion that has to go on to, to get to this place. We also have some of the most polluted systems in the world. And when you take a look at this, this slide, it says quite a lot. Um, there are two different types of, of methodologies that are used here. One of them, on the, on the bottom left, is looking at the relationship between trophic status as an indication of lack of degradation and levels of total phosphorus. And it just re-emphasizes the point that our pristine systems actually have lower nutrient levels than almost anywhere in the world. We don't have the same problems of atmospheric fallout and uh, other contaminants that they may have in other parts of the world, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. However, our systems that have changed, our systems that are strongly influenced by agricultural intensification, are a lot worse, quite a lot worse. And you can see that by the little point on the right-hand side of that bottom left graph, which indicates that phosphorus levels actually exceed anywhere in the world. And if you go to my particular region in the Waikato, you'll find that the nutrient levels in the Waikato lakes are actually higher than any other group of lakes as, as a group than anywhere else I've seen in the world. And we can also quantify that through um, what's known as a reference state. Now, reference state refers to some sort of almost mythical uh, pre-human condition and we can find lakes, such as the one I showed you, Opal Lake, uh, which exemplify that. In this particular case, um, the dash line there represents um, nearly a 200% increase or a doubling of nutrient levels in a lake in relation to total phosphorus and total nitrogen. And you can see that New Zealand still has a large number of lakes that are very close to what we call a, a reference condition. Those lakes are mostly um, in, in the mountainous regions of, of New Zealand, um, tend to be inland. And you can also see that uh, in some cases we've got an 1800% increase in nutrient levels, or a 3400% increase, 34 times what would be a reference level for nutrients in those lakes. So trying to bring those back into something approaching some sort of a reference condition is going to be an enormous challenge, a huge challenge. And remember the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management said, said to maintain or improve. Okay? And those lakes aren't going to fit into the maintain because they'll sit below a bottom line which has been prescribed in the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. Just to put it another way, um, relationships between total phosphorus and total nitrogen now, these are the drivers of what actually happens biologically in many of our systems. And again, you can find that we have some lakes which have lower nutrient levels than just about anywhere in the world. I won't mention to you that some of those actually happen to be um, dams or have been artificially manipulated. However, there are many lakes that do fit within that category. There are also some other lakes which are just about higher than anywhere else in the world. And I can let you see some of those lakes, Rotorua, South Island, not North Island, by the way. So I wanted to have a look at one of the national policy statements, um, one aspect of it, which is around the National Objectives Framework. And that National Objectives Framework prescribes quantitative values. In this particular case, I'm putting up legals for chlorophyll A. Now, Contrary to what 
Mike mentioned about, uh, about rivers. Lakes, I believe, are actually pretty well prescribed. The levels that are here in the National Objectives Framework are actually quite hard to meet. And you'll see there that there's an A, B and C category as well as D. D falls below the bottom line. That necessitates automatically that there has to be an improvement. And that level is actually at, uh, less than tw a median of 12 milligrams per cubic metre of chlorophyll A, the indication of the algal growth that occurs within a lake. That's actually quite a tough limit to meet. And Rotorua, for example, where there's been a lot of work that's gone on and people are actually re-engaging with the lake in particular, um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. But it has changed significantly, but it still falls just into a D category. Now, that seems sort of counterintuitive a little bit to some of the changes that have been occurring in Lake Rotorua over the past five or six years. If we now go to one of the streams that feeds into Rotorua, and this is the Puarenga stream, probably the worst um, in terms of nutrient levels and in terms of fecal coliforms of any of the streams that enters Lake Rotorua. And about two weeks ago, I, um, I had a, a very good meeting with um, Iwi associated and Hapu associated with the Puarenga in particular. And I said to them, well, according to the national policy statement, the poor ring stream fits into an A or a B category. And they sort of looked at me and said, no, that's not our A or B category. Definitely not. Now, how is it that the rivers can get away with being in an A or B category and the poor ring is definitely a D? Sorry, but it's a D. And yet the lakes can be, in, in this case for Rotorua, was categorised as a D. So there are some mismatches here, and we need to work quickly to address those, particularly in the river systems, where fecal coliforms in the poor ringer can be present, and yet the poor ringer still meets an A category or possibly a B category in terms of its assessment in the National Objectives Framework. So just a little bit about uh, sort of I guess this is uh, biogeochemistry 101 as it pertains to, um, to the environment. Nitrogen in particular, and just to give you some idea of how this relates, how this 101 biogeochemistry relates perhaps to limit setting in the context of New Zealand in particular. So we have our national objectives framework limits for streams and rivers that have been prescribed. And we know for lakes at least that they're they're a pretty good and strong guide as to what, what is desirable. There are alternatives um, that can be used, but there's also what happens on the land. And we've already heard that the land can be dissociated in terms of uh, regulatory mechanisms from what's in, in fresh water. On the land, we can look at different models to be able to address uh, intensification, for example. And if you look at the clean water, if you look at the, um, the US situation, or you perhaps you go to the European Union, then um, you can look at an input-based restriction. That is restricting the number of animals on the land, or, for example, the amount of fertiliser that's applied on the land. So that is an input-based restriction. That is quite different to what we're proposing in New Zealand, which doesn't necessarily restrict the inputs, it restricts what comes out at the farm level. So in other words, um, a farmer might potentially be able to intensify. It's predicated upon the assumption that they won't be increasing the amount that actually comes out of the available terms of nutrients. And so that's a major change from others. And to be able to do that, we are very reliant on models, and those models are quite complex because there's a number of processes that occur from the far scale, below the root zone, to where the water actually might enter a key water body that we're interested in in prescribing limits. And to be able to address that, we've got things, we've got models. And those models are very reliant on what we call, for example, attenuation. What happens when the nitrate that comes, for example, through cow urine 
gets leached below the, the water, the soil surface, and into the groundwater aquifer, what actually happens to that nitrogen? And we call it generally attenuation. Attenuation is a very complex process, and we're aligned at the moment on models to be able to try to understand that, and also the models to not just record what's happened in the past, but to drive us into the future to be able to make predictions. Okay, very quick snapshot. Those models are quite complex. At the late model, at the, at the late level, I think we're quite confident of some of the tools we've been using. They're internationally recognised, and uh, in this particular case, we might use them to be able to predict into the future for Lake Rotorua, for example. We predict up to 2100 what the impacts of climate change and land use intensification may be. Now, <clears throat> aside from the models, think about again about the input based approach. And that input based approach would not allow potentially something like this to happen over the last five or ten years. It is a massive change in. in in this particular case, the amount of urea fertiliser in particular that has uh, been put on the landscape as farmers around the 1990s turned increasingly away from clover-based nitrogen fixation towards, um, towards applications of urea. And I wondered about why such a dramatic level off, and I think Alison's already said it, and I don't need to say much about the amount of palm tree and nutrients that are associated with that. We lead the world. If you don't want an input-based input, input -based approach, then you better be sure that you've got everything sorted out for an output-based approach. In other words, optimising farm scale efficiencies so that these changes, can you address the, the level of these changes through efficiencies on the farm? That's what this whole model is predicated upon. And if you are using models to be able to try and make predictions, then you better have some rules for these models. They better be founded on very comprehensive scientific documentation, written guidance on how to parameterize them, get external peer review, develop intellectual capacity widely in the models, clearly document their sources of error, provide good visualisation output to stakeholders. Those are prerequisites and fundamental to any model that is to be used in an environmental system. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides. So what sort of activities or what sort of things are we being forced into by the national policy statement? Well, um, to be able to address a limits-based approach. At the moment, we're actually, we're actually being quite successful, at least in the Rotorua Lakes, with some of the geoengineering type approaches, adding materials to be able to address the legacies of excess nutrients that have been added to these systems in the past. The use of alum, aqua P, uh, are some such examples. And when you turn to Lake Rotorua, alum has been added. It's addressed many of the legacies of past excess use of phosphorus, and it has been extremely successful in bringing Lake Rotorua back to a level of uh, which is it's approximating historical levels in the 1960s in terms of water quality. There's also some big ticket items which are quite dramatic as well. Um, this is regarded as a success, um, which is a $10 million wall that has been used to divert water from Rotorua away from the main basin of Lake Rotorua and into the Kalatuna River. It's had a dramatic effect on, on Lake Rotorua. Um, the improvement in water quality has been very marked over the past five or so years in particular. And Again, another example of what we call an in-lake action. But the greatest challenge is on the catchment and those catchment nutrients. How are we going to address a whole of system approach and we have to start in addressing those catchment-based nutrients so that these actions 
can be done from time to time, they address past legacies, but we're not going to be able to afford the ongoing cost of these types of things on a, an annual or a decadal type basis. So we wanted to uh, just finish very briefly with um, a little context here. National policy statement for freshwater management, the key underpinning of that is the national objectives framework. Scientists need to be bold here to make recommendations on what needs to be put into that. That includes the, <coughs> the addressing connectivity of estuaries and wetlands. It includes additional attributes besides some of the nutrients, but also sediments and some of the other floor and fauna that people are interested in. It includes, um, it will necessitate more mitigation strategies being used and um, increasingly uh, those to meet some of the objectives quickly may be in late type approaches which are extremely expensive. So that was the actually the summary slide, but I couldn't resist to put to put the slide in as I heard the, this discussion around nitrogen and phosphorus. <clears throat> Every system that I've looked at in terms of lakes has been what we call co-limited. It's neither nitrogen or phosphorus. At sometimes it's nitrogen, at sometimes it's phosphorus. They may vary spatially, they may vary temporally. It's both of those nutrients, as well as sediment, that, that and those are the critical things to be able to address the degradation of lakes at least. I won't talk so much about rivers. There are other specialists talking about rivers. But I have virtually never seen anything that's not co-limited. So don't tell me that the system is nitrogen limited in terms of its algal growth or phosphorus limited. Almost always it's co-limited. We've got the studies. We've collated all of the lake studies in New Zealand. And we've also added to those more recently was looking at specific lakes. We find they're temporally and, and spatially either co-limited or um, limited by one of those nutrients at different points in time or in space. Thank you.